I heard some, somebody just told me that I better just be ready to end when it was lunchtime. This is being recorded. I understand it's going to be on pay per view next week. So. <laughs> But we appreciate the effort. So we're talking about how do we we get get some we, when we're talking to a prospect, how do we get that prospect to understand? Well, you know, we've got to have to help them discover the problem, discover the need. And we've got to sort of upset their balance a little bit, asking those tough questions, suggesting the solution. I call it the hmm principle, you know, they got you gotta get them scratched in their head. Like, hmm, what's he talking about? That, that could be important. That could be something I need. Because if you let them regain their balance, once you got them off balance, they go back to that, I'm okay. Again, you know, you got to start over. They forget the need. You have to start over. Or the competition comes in and gets them back upright. So we have to always be presenting the solution every time so that they understand what we're talking about and then eventually we have to draw the net we got to close the cell we've got to come to the decision point don't overcomplicate it don't oversimplify it but just simply present it Paul said I wanted to know Christ and him crucified no more no less I presented the death, burial, and resurrection. When is the process complete? Yeah, when they become a Christian. That completes the evangelism. That doesn't complete everything, but that completes that process. So it's a point in time conscious decision. I mean, and brother, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. There's the decision point. You either do that or you did. So, let me change programs here right quick. Hopefully this works. Should have done that while we were standing there. The fancy term for the hmm thing yep. in psychology is called cognitive dissonance. Your thinking has become muddled and you're not quite sure so you need to, you need to fix it it has to be fixed yeah. the idea is to get people thinking that lady that was trying to quote tried to sell that car she never got us thinking the only thing we could think about was that whatever it was twenty thousand dollars or not twenty thousand dollars okay let's talk about how we do present the good news Here's the next question for your notebook. Do you routinely initiate conversations with people for the purpose of presenting the gospel message? The key word here is initiate. Do you routinely initiate conversations with people for the purpose of presenting the gospel? When I use the term risk avoidance, avoidance do you know what I'm saying? what I'm talking about. We like to avoid risk, right? Keeping my mouth shut, there's no risk. There's no risk of rejection. There's no risk of actually having to talk. So my question is, do you initiate conversations with the purpose of presenting the gospel? Next question. Have you ever taught the gospel on a private individual basis? Have you ever sat down at a table, across the table with someone and studied with them? Have you ever sat in, you know, in their living room and talked to them? Or... And the last question, can you take the scriptures and show a person what you did to become a Christian? Fundamental. 
Can you take the scripture and show a person what you did to become a Christian? We talked about that word persuade a while ago. And that's a very scriptural word, persuade. And you say, oh, that sounds like a salesperson, you know. I hate those used car people that try to trick, want to get me to buy a car because they're trying to persuade me to buy it. Sure they are. Persuade means to cause someone to do something by asking or giving reasons for it, for it, to plead or to urge. It involves rational, social, cultural, emotional, spiritual elements. This persuasion. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath talking about Paul and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. He said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. Paul says, I'm telling you the truth, and it's reasonable. It's logical. You know? Don't just tell somebody they're wrong. Don't just tell them what they're doing wrong. Tell them how to be right. How many of us like to be told we're wrong? Now, did I say compromise the truth? Did I say give them false hope? No. I said simply tell them the truth. Appeal to reason and logic. Paul didn't say, Festus, man, you are so wrong it's not even funny. He said, I'm not mad, but I speak words of truth and reason. Logic. I'm going to convince you. I'm going to influence your way of thinking by the truth and by reason. I'm going to influence your thoughts with that. As Americans, we cherish freedom, right? So if I was talking to someone, wouldn't logic be that I talk to somebody, an American, I might talk about freedom from sin? In that logical connection? You have to think that way. You're in bondage. No, I'm a free man. No, you're in bondage to sin. Let me show you how to get out of it. I didn't know I was in it. But yeah, you are. Remember? They don't know the need. They don't see the problem. There is no problem. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We're not well known to God, and I trust well known in, in your consciences. Paul said, we implore you. And the love of Christ compels us. God pleads with us. We know the consequences of failure. We know the severity of disobedience. You know, we all like incentives, right? Oh, buy one, get one free. Is that an incentive? <coughs> Free shipping on Amazon. Is that an incentive? <laughs> yeah. Prime days. Is that an incentive? You know, you know what I'm talking about. People like rewards. And they make decisions based on rewards. Hey, I got fifteen dollars of Cole's cash. <laughs> we better go to Cole's today. I like this. I like this one. The more you spend, the more you save. Yeah. <laughs> I love to go to Belkin. Now, those little girls at Belkin have been trained. When they give you your receipt, they'll go, "You saved three hundred and twenty-two dollars today." And I always tell, I always look at Roxanne and I go, "Hey, if you keep buying, pretty soon they'll owe us money." And the girl, one girl said, "It doesn't work that way." <laughs> but yeah, we like incentives. We like rewards. So what would Paul talk about? What would they talk about? The rewards. Or the avoidance of punishment. He said, we know the terror of the Lord, so we persuade men. We try to make them understand. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers in the marketplace daily <laughs> those who happened to be there in Acts 17. He says, it was logical. I'm giving proof. I'm talking facts. 
It's a logical conclusion. Something you can think through. You can understand. It's not blind faith. It's based on ev the evidence that we have in the Word. You know, <clears throat> if you think about the term reconciliation, now that's sort of religious jargon, isn't it? Reconciliation, sanctification. A lot of folks don't understand words like that. So first of all, we should got to make sure they understand the word. But if you think about that term reconciliation, isn't that a very logical word when it comes to salvation? That we were apart from God because of our sin and reconciliation through Christ and through the cross has brought us back to Him? Doesn't that make sense? That's the facts. That's the gospel. And if we think it through, reasonable, it makes sense to us. It makes sense to everybody. Guy went down to the store, the general store, to buy a light bulb. And he gets there in the, in the store and all on all the shelves was bags of salt, bags of salt, bags of salt. He says, I need a light bulb. And the guy says, well, I think I got one down in the basement. So he goes down in the basement with him. And the guy starts digging around, finally comes out with one light bulb. He says, yeah, I got one. And the guy says, and there's more salt down in the basement. And he says, you sure must sell a lot of salt. The guy says, no, I don't sell any. He said, but that guy that sells me salt, boy, he can sell salt. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's what we got to be. People who can use reason and logic to sell our product. To show people they need our product. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for the three Sabbaths reasoned to them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. Saying, This Jesus I preach to you is the Christ. And some were persuaded. Now, what did Paul do? He made it evident. He made it easy for them to see. He described it, he showed it to them. You know, sometimes we, we back off and we say, oh, they're going to ask me some hard questions. They're going to ask me questions I can't explain. They're going to ask me questions I can't answer. First of all, the world usually doesn't know hard questions. They just don't know hard, the, quest, the questions that are too hard. All we have to do is be reasonable with our answer. From the, what Paul said, he reasoned to them from the scriptures. Paul didn't say, it was my opinion, what I wanted, what I, he said, I explained and demonstrated with the scriptures who Christ was, who he is. And so he, he taught them. He reasoned with them. That's a skill. That's a skill we can develop. That's a skill we can improve. It's a skill we need. We can reason and demonstrate with the scriptures. He says, I'm going to make it clear. I want you to look at this very clearly. I'm going to affirm it as fact. Make it known in every detail about who Jesus is. Now, what do you do when somebody asks you those sort of off the wall, off the subject questions? You know, you're trying to explain to them who Jesus is, their need for Jesus because of their sin problem. And you're trying to get them to understand about what they need to do. And they go, hey, how come y'all don't use pianos down there at that church? What are you going to do? That's a good question. We'll deal with it. You know, what's important to that person should be important to you. If you don't answer it, and you can answer it later, but if you don't eventually answer it, what are they going to say? What's going to be in their head all the time? He didn't answer that question. I still don't know why they don't use a piano down there at that church. And that's important to me, or I wouldn't ask. Right? So what should we do? Well, instead of getting into this big theological debate, Here's what the scriptures say. This is why we don't we don't have one. Now let's go back to 
what we were talking about. So you don't you don't control importance. That person you're talking with knows what's important to them. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Simple, clear. They knew the answer. You know, they didn't make a big deal about it. Took him aside and said, here's what you need to know. It was a good use of time. They, their timing was right. I talked last night about that young man that came to my door and said, you know, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? Good question, but the timing was wrong. You know, he had known me all of 10 seconds. See, often we have to unteach first. That's what they had to do here. They had to explain more accurately. You know, I know you know about the baptism of John, and that was important, but let me show you what's happening now. Let me give you the new. What, happened, what you have to know now. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him in his lodging, to whom he explained and testified, solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning to evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. Bear witness, some versions use here, is that's a legal term. You know? He's giving evidence truthfully. And he says he did it what? Testified in the law using the law of Moses and the prophets. The scriptures are the basis of my proof. The scriptures are what are going to tell you that this is fact. Not what I'm saying, not my opinion, not my take on matters. This is what the scriptures say. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes the first, and also the Jew first, and also the Greek. What's the word ashamed mean? It means we don't want to be unpopular, right? We don't want to be called a fanatic. We don't want to lose our status in the community. We don't want to be ridiculed. We don't want to offend anyone, those kinds of things. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. None of those apply to the gospel. Why? Because it's what God has given us for salvation. You know, we have to overcome that resistance, uh, the society's resistance sometimes to Christianity. We do that by the way we live and by what we say. And we looked at this scripture a lot last night. That Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me. Go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. See, we have to convince people that Jesus is the Lord. We have to convince people that He is to be obeyed. We have to create in them a desire to be obedient, to follow His teachings. And then we have to baptize that disciple. And teach them to live as Christ would desire. So it comes down to this. When we're talking to someone about their need for Jesus, we have to have a solution that fulfills the need. Anything you can look at, just about, has a features and functions and benefits. Every product, every product, most of them have this. And we can apply this to the gospel. Somewhere, let me see if I got one right quick. If I wanted to sell this pen to Carl, what am I going to tell Carl about my pen? Well, let's look at some things. First of all, we talked a while ago about they had to feel pain, right? To have a need or a want, there has to be some pain. Unfulfilled want is a pain. 
unfulfilled need is a pain. Or something that goes wrong is a pain. So what would be the benefit of owning this pen, Carl? Well, Carl, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to eliminate all the pain problems you have. I'm going to solve your problems with the features and the functions of my pen. I'm going to persuade you. I'm going to convince you. I'm going to explain to you. I'm going to demonstrate to you. I'm going to give you some reasonable things. And I'm going to do it through questions. Carl, have you ever put a pen in your pocket and looked down and you got a big ink stain right there? Yep. Well, Carl, guess what? My pen has a little clicker on it. And if you press it, it goes back up in there and you don't end up with ink on your shirt. I just eliminated your pain right there, Carl. Carl, have you ever looked for your pen and you couldn't find it? You looked all over the place and couldn't find it? Hey, Carl, my pen has got this little clip on it. Clips right on your pocket. Always be there, real handy. Right? Hey, Carl, have you ever wrote for a long time and your hand got really tired and you just, you know, got cramps in your hand and all that for writing? Well, Carl, look at my pen. It's got this little rubber thing down here on you. Very comfortable. Makes it easy to write. Yeah. We can go on and on and on, but you get the picture, right? Give me two boxes. Two boxes. <laughs> for three dollars a piece. <laughs> so what was the point? Well, here's the features, here's what they do, and here's the benefit to you. Can we take that same kind of logic and apply it to the gospel? See, the prospect wants to know what's going to fill his need. Carl says, I want something that doesn't leave ink stains, I want something I don't lose, and I want something that's comfortable. That's his want. Well, I got something that's got all the functions on it that'll benefit him to the point where he, we eliminated his needs. We've got rid of the pain points. And I'm gonna, I persuaded him by just actually demonstrating them, right? Pointing them out to him. So, the feature is the part of the gospel or what the gospel is. Paul just told us what the gospel is, right? God's power, salvation. That's what it is. That's the feature, the function, the act that particular part of the gospel performs, what it does, what each part of the gospel does. We'll talk about that here in a second. And the benefit is the advantage that I get that I receive from using that feature and that function. Here's the scriptures. Power of God for salvation. If you abide in my word and are truly my disciples, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now we remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved. See, that's what it is. That's what it did. It's what it does. Here's the functions. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds has been reconciled in his body by the flesh of his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before God. What's the feature? Reconciliation. I mean the function. Reconciliation. It, that's what it does. It brings us back to God. So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We get eternal life. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. This is what it does for us. Here's the benefits. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in Him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory. 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Isn't that the solution to our need? Isn't that the benefits we were looking for? Doesn't that solve our problem? So if you were to present these kind of, that kind of logical thinking, and that's logical to me, here's what it is, here's what it does, here's what you get. What should I do next? How do I get it? How do I get it? So I might have some closing questions. And by closing, I don't mean, I mean closing to pull that net. That closing by sealing the deal. Maybe I might have just asked that person, does this make sense to you? Is this logical to you? Is there anything that we've discussed you don't quite understand? Maybe we need to go back over it a little bit. Did I teach you anything that wasn't in the Bible? You know, when we went through those features, functions, and benefits, all I gave you was nine different scriptures. We could have added a lot more, but you got the picture. We only use the Bible. And then we say, would you like to obey Christ now? Would you like to become a Christian now? And then they might ask us how, and then we can continue the discussion. See, and presenting just part of it doesn't work. We've got to present all of it. As evangelists, we need to talk about and demonstrate the features that lead to the benefits. The benefit is eternal life. The benefit is a life with God. The benefit is this sealing of the Holy Spirit for eternal life and inheritance. No, that's, the, that's the benefit, but we've got to tell you how to get there. That's the features. And we've got to personalize it. We talked about it a while ago. It's got to be personal. And we paint the picture where that, that person sees in his head. The light comes on. He sees it. He understands it, that it's for him. And after each time we talk about these things, after each contact, after each attempt, Maybe we have to come back with more of these features and functions and benefits. But think about that. Every time you do that, they got to make another decision. It's a new decision point. I've got to decide again whether to accept or not accept what's being taught to me. So we get a new, new time for that. So when do you ask? those questions about do you understand, do you want to study more, are you ready to obey? Well, when the prospect's ready. And then you do it continually. Like that young man, he knew what to do, he knows what to do. I don't have to reteach that kind of stuff. He knows. I just got to keep coming back. So when you're through talking and when you're through listening, and that's a long time. Patience. We've got to make sure of that. See, here's the thing. The main reason people say no is because they don't know enough to say yes. That's why we're still persuading, convincing, explaining, demonstrating the gospel. Presenting the gospel. Yeah. And let me tell you this. When you're talking to someone, presenting the gospel, present it and then shut up and listen. Because you need to give that person a chance to talk. You know, have you ever heard somebody that just keeps on and they don't give you the, they don't be quiet enough for you to get, tell them you've got questions or you want to know or whatever? You know, present the gospel and then be quiet and listen. See what they have, what they're thinking. And don't try to outdo the prospect. Oh, you're a sinner? Let me tell you about my life, man. I've got, I was sinning a lot more than you ever thought about. 
You got stories and you hadn't heard anything. Let me tell you my story. Don't do that. You know, keep it upbeat. Keep it positive. Focus on the distinctive nature of the church. I'm a, you know, that book, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ. Why I'm not a member of these other churches. You know, that's important. So focus on that distinctive nature of that Christ, the church that Christ died for. So we need to clearly understand and clearly articulate the differences in these features, functions, and benefits of the gospel and lead it to the solution. What does the word articulate mean? Explain. Explain. Define. What's the basics of it? Speaking. Speaking. Yeah. Our challenge is to be able to clearly speak the gospel, tell the story, communicate, and use words that produce positive reactions. Yeah. Why? That's not a bad word. Which? Plurals like we, let's, those kinds of things. Use very clear illustrations that they can connect with what you're talking about, that they can make an application to. And quote from God's Word. And, and you don't have to quote, you can show from God's Word. But use God's Word. It's hard to argue with God, right? Should be. So just simply use His Word. That's what Paul said he did. Use the Old Testament Scriptures. And eventually end up with that solution. The way for you to acquire this <coughs> is to be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's how you acquire it. That's how you get it. I want to run through something real quick. In Matthew chapter 10, we call it the limited commission, right? Christ sent out his apostles two by two. And we can connect that mission that he sent them out. We call it limited commission. Our commission is the great commission. But we see some similarities and some connections. He tells us to go. He, told, he told, tells us to go into all the world. He told them exactly where to go there in, in Judea. I've heard people say, you know, I don't want to be around those kind of people. And I'm not talking about church people, I'm talking about sinners. I've heard Christians say, I don't want to be around sinners. Well, let me tell you something. Separation is not isolation. We're separate from the world, but we're in it. So he says, go ye into where? All the world. He's going to send his apostles out into the, their world. Right? He didn't say you're going to go out there and just... Be separate from all these other people. You know, you're going out here and talk to them. you got a clear message I'm going to give you. And so he, he sends them. It's an act of him sending. And they have a commission to carry on a work. You have something to say. And you're to perform a service. There's things you're going to do. And there's a specific task with which you're being charged. These 12 Jesus, I'm sorry if I got ahead of your camera there. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles, do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. That's their job. You know, here's your purpose. Tell them that the kingdom is hand. And he says, as you go, not if you go, not when you go, but as you go. Same way with us. Go you into all the world. Urgency of the message. This needs to be t told right now. So get out there and tell it. <clears throat> Preach about the coming of this kingdom. Now, they could have went out there and said, I'm going to preach about how bad the Romans are. I'm going to preach about, you know, how bad Herod and his folks are treating us. How much taxes we're having to pay. 
I could have preached on, you know, how I love the law of Moses. Their favorite topic, the news of the day, the politics of the day, whatever. But he said, here's the message. You're going to go out and preach that the kingdom is at hand. Very specific. You're concentrated on this one message. You're going to present, you're going to sell this one product. You're going to tell this on single message. Christ and him crucified is our message. The gospel of Jesus Christ. You're going to heal the hurting. That's what you need to be out here telling. Kingdom is at hand. And then they were, of course, later understand more about that and the gospel of Christ. He says, in whatever city or town you enter, inquire who is worthy and stay till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. And so on and so on. And what's he saying? Be effective. Focus on what's necessary. And if it's not working, move on. See, we, have, we talk about limited resources. Time is a limited resource. There's at times, there's t very few times, but there's times, sometimes, when we have to just move on. Because we can spend our time with somebody that we're never going to reach at the expense of ten other people we could reach. And it's a hard decision, but that's sort of what he's talking about. Whoever will not receive or hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust, and it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah judgment in that city. But he's telling them, here you're going to go, far and near, whatever town, all the world, you're going to do these things. It's what applies to us. Well, what problems were they going to run into? People that wouldn't listen. Do we get that? Sure. You know, here's the lessons for us. Rejection and persecution is to be expected. But, did he say, well, once you run into that, come back. Once you figure out they're not going to listen, just come on back. No, move to the next one. Right? You know, when, <clears throat> when we talk about sales, how many no's does a salesman get before he gets a yes? <laughs> Studies say that they get at least four no's before they ever get a yes. On average. So when we get a no, does that mean we just say, well, okay, they're not going to do it. They're not going to listen. They're not going to take it. You know, they don't want the gospel, so let's go on. No. We have to understand rejection and keep going. But don't answer excuses. And excuses were those things about, well, my mother or my father, you know, you can come up, you've heard people, they got all kinds of excuses why they shouldn't obey the gospel. When you start answering those excuses, you know, well, if, if, you know, if I was to obey the gospel, that would mean my mother was lost. Well, you know, those, you know, those are excuses. Those are people, sometimes they're legit and sometimes they're sincere, but most of the time they're just a stall tactic. You know, and if we try to answer all that, we lose control of the conversation. And we need to keep control of the, the conversation. Christ didn't say, I'm commissioning you to go out and debate every theological debate that's known to mankind. What was his commission? Preach the gospel. You know, teach them that. You know, present the gospel. When you get into an argument with somebody over whatever... Who loses? I told him, well, I got, I got old Mark. I, he didn't know what to say after I said this. I, I, put, I shut him up. Who won the argument? Because what did Mark go away saying, thinking? Well, I know I'm going to go figure out what, how I can come get him back next time. We're going to continue this. He just thought that was over. Right? We both lose. So when we say people won't listen, it's our job to, if somebody gives you something that's good, something that's logical, something that's 
beneficial. People will listen. Not everyone, but people will listen. People will be combative. People like to argue. Some people do. So, you know, we just have to understand that and, and not get into that. He said, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpent and harmless as dove. He says, there's some danger out there. But we were told, be faithful unto death. We know what to say. Do you believe that? I guarantee you, we all know what to say. We might not feel comfortable saying it. We may have some struggle with, uh, you know, getting it out. But we know what to say. We know what the Bible teaches. So what's the skill here? Wise and harmless. That's the skill. How we say it. He tells them. He says, you know, you got to beware. But he says, when it was given to you that in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now he's talking about them having a little different gift than we did. But we have his word right in front of us. We can open it up and look at it. We have the ability to learn it. We have the ability to memorize it. We have the ability to know it. And so he says, wise and harmless. We're not out there to beat up people and win our argument. We're not out there to show them we know more than they do. We're out there to bring them to Christ. And so sometimes we have the incorrect fear. Remember what he said? See, there's going to be these objections and these excuses. And if we know people are going to do that, if we know that this is the thing that they're keyed in on, and this is the thing that they're concerned about, if we bring it up before they do, we're in control. You know, we, don't have the, we don't have time, or we, we take the, the element of each one of us having to take a side. If we bring it up before they do. Well, let me tell you about, you know, this. See, and know the difference between an excuse and a sincere problem and a sincere question. See, he says the fear is you fear about rejection, you fear about offending people, you fear about getting into an argument, you fear about not knowing. He says, don't fear that. Here's what you need to fear. Fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. That's what we should fear. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father is in heaven. That's a promise. So by being quiet, is that denial? You say, I, I would never deny. Sort of like Peter, I wouldn't do it. But is being quiet denial? He says, there's the other thing. He will acknowledge us before God if we do, do our job. And the opposite is also true. He denies us. And he tells us these messages are going to cause division. There's no way around it. Not everybody's just going to agree with us. Not everybody's going to buy what we're selling. I use that literal, uh, figuratively. It's going to cause division. <coughs> so we have to be ready for that. That's where that wise and harmless comes in. And it, but he says your dedication is going to be rewarded. There's a reward for what we do. So let's talk about how. Well, when we talk about wise and harmless, if I start giving my opinion rather than the truth, I'm asking for it.
if I start giving my feelings instead of the truth, that I'm I'm not wise and harmless. Present the truth with some proof. The evidence that's intuitive. We know there's a God. People know there's a God. I, I heard a very valid argument the other day about it. there is no such thing as an atheist. And people would say, oh, I'm an atheist. And this guy was actually debating uh, some guy from the whatever the atheist society is. You know, they have a group, an organization. And this was a... He was a preacher, and I'm trying to think. I think he was a reformer preacher. If you know what reformer or Calvinistic kind of preachers. But anyway, I thought he did an excellent job because he went to Romans where it says, you know, you're without excuse. You know there is a God by what, what you see around you. He said, so you can say you're an atheist, but you're really not. <laughs> and the guy really, you know, he got, oh, yes, I am. No, you're not. <laughs> God says you're not. So anyway, there's intuitive evidence. This better way. We're told to be ready to give a reason for what? The hope that's within us. You know, here's a better way. There's a reason for our hope. There's a better life out there. A better life in the future, but there's a better life now. Yeah, better way. Historical evidence. Some people want to know things, other things. You know, there's history that says there was a man named Christ. The Bible is a historical book. It tells us about those things. Yeah. And we can talk about faith and how it's changed our life and how it will change their life and all of these things. But our approach has to be right. Our approach has to be right. We have to support what we're talking about. We have to show those features, functions, and benefits of the gospel that we've been presenting. We've got to have the right approach in doing that. We can't be too strong. We can't be too weak. We've got to help people to understand. So we're reaching the world. So we need to be aggressive. Ah, but we hate aggressive people. We don't like aggressive people, right? You know, I was told you about the story of Drew trying to buy this car and this lady really sort of not selling it. A couple weeks later, my smarter son, he's sitting back there, <laughs> Drew's not here. <laughs> he comes and he says, Dad, you want to go over to, I'm looking at a new, I think it was a Nissan over here, this place. I said, sure. So we went over there on a Saturday. We pulled up, and this young man come out, and he goes, how can I help you? And we said, well, he said, I'm wanting to look at an Xterra, a little SUV. And that kid literally, from the office or from the showroom, took off in a dead run out there on the lot, jumped in an Xterra, pulled it up there where we were standing, threw all the doors open, raised the hood, popped the hat, and started showing us everything on that car. Didn't tell us anything about money. You know, <coughs> hey, this got this, it's got that, this works this way, this does this, this is, this is everything. Was that aggressive? In some ways it was. But it was the right kind of aggressive. We have to be careful, it's a balance, right? <clears throat> we have to be non-offensive, but yet we've got to present the message. So, uh, it's not that we be defensive, but he says be harmless. So we can be aggressive without being someone who's offensive. In other words, we just keep at it. Intellectual. This is sort of the new, th I shouldn't say the new thing, but if you read some, again, some of the research that, that people have put out, younger generations, I don't know these generations, X, Y, Zs, I don't know which ones are which anymore, <laughs> but the younger generation, and we looked at the deal over here a while ago, of, or last night, 23% of people under 30 now claim to be Christians, and that's the lowest number it's been in a long time. One of the things they say, is, you know, no one's ever 
presented this to me in an intellectual way. In a studious, educational kind of concept. It's always been, well, I'm your mama and your daddy, you better do what I tell you, you better go to church with me. We talked about losing members, losing our kids in the church. Again, people have told me, and I've had reliable people tell me, it's because parents do not let kids or help kids create their own faith. They're all too dependent upon the parents' faith so that when they get away from the parents, faith is gone. Because they've never had a chance to develop it themselves. So intellectual, what Paul say? I reasoned with you. Isn't that intellectual thinking? Compassion is important. People have to know that we care, see that we care. I've really never liked this statement, but you hear it a lot. I'd rather see a sermon than hear a sermon. Well, I've never seen a sermon. But I get I understand what they're talking about. That we set the right example for others. And so they see that, they see our compassion. We don't come across as somebody who's, you know, just out there telling fairy tales. It's an intellectual discussion and that we continue with it. The best way to ensure that a lost person stays lost is to do what? Say and do nothing. Apathy. That is usually due to our fear. That's due to our looking around and not knowing what to do. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and then He arose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Does that sound intellectual to you? Yeah. Paul says, let me show you this. First of all, he says, I declare it. Some versions say proclaim Again, we're back to that articulate, verbal, open in his mouth. I'm declaring to you the gospel. He says, it's the same one I preached to you. you know, I'm going to write it, but I preached it as well. And he said, you received it. And you stand in it. But here's the benefit by which you're saved. Right? Here's what you got out of it. You're saved. And he said, I delivered what I learned, what I received. Christ died for our sins. I got proof according to the scriptures. And I can back it up. And he was buried, and then he arose the third, again the third day. Again, according to the scriptures, it fulfilled the prophecies. I can prove all of this. Here's another thing that people are looking for, and we write this off and don't think about this and don't use this, but people like certainty of doctrine. Called doctrinal certitude. Again, in some of the surveys, this is what attracted some people. They didn't like people, they didn't like these congregations or these churches that say, well, we all believe something different, but we all worship together. That's the way a mega church gets by, right? You can believe this, and you can believe that, and you can believe this, but we're all in one big happy family. Now, there's a lot of people that want certainty of doctrine. They want to see a commitment to fundamental biblical principles, beliefs, that does not waver. Now, would we attract more people by being the other way? Sure. It's comfortable, it's easy, makes us feel good. We're a big, one big happy family. 
social club, whatever we want to call it, but we're not the church. And so <clears throat> we need to be very clear, and that's what Paul was doing here, and that's why I put this up here. Paul was very clear. Now, I declare, this is what I declare. I'm not going to change that. It's not gonna, we're not going to do something else. This is it. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. See, a lot of these, I, this is another one of those words that you hear a lot, but unchurched. I don't know anybody that's actually been unchurched, but what they're saying is people who don't claim a church are not impressed by us not clearly proclaiming what we believe and why. I told you that young man came to my door the other night and he handed me a card. And will you, first question he asked me, will you take this card? And I said, sure. Yeah. Well, I didn't, I just stuck it in my pocket. I didn't look at it until after he was gone. But, you know, what was on the card? Here's what we believe. Now, it was all wrong and it didn't match up with the scriptures and it was in error but it was clearly stated. Is there anything wrong with that? I know there's something wrong with what it said, but I'm talking about is there anything wrong with having what we believe clearly stated, printed, written down, able to hand and give to somebody? Sometimes it's that simple. Another thing the research shows us is that the preacher and Connection to that with doctrine were major factors of influence. Not how good he was, not how charismatic he was, but that you know he presented the doctor, doctrine <coughs> clearly, concisely, consistently. That it didn't change. And that research was done by something called Surprising Insight from the Unchurched by in a book by a guy named Rainier. So, you know, we're not making this up. But if we look at what Paul said, Paul says, here it is. And if we look at folks who we talk to, that we discuss the scriptures with, you know, they have some different options. We have to gauge their level of interest. And why would we do that? Meet them where they are. When Philip ran alongside that chariot, he says, Oh, throw that, you know, close Isaiah. Let's start over here in Genesis. What was the idea? Meeting where he was at, right? So we have to look at resist uh, openness. Some people are totally resistant. I'm not going to listen. You can't make me. Don't want to hear it. Get off my porch. Go back home. Leave me alone. Right? <laughs> Some people are aware. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I used to hear about church. My grandmother went, used to take me to church, you know. Then there's those who sort of have this guarded receptivity. They say, well, you know, at least they got a little interest. But they don't want to get too, they don't want you to get too deep with them too fast. They don't want you to, they don't want to commit to anything. And then there's people who have concern and interest and it's there. Then you have people who really want to learn, who are open and want to understand. And then you get people who are close to a decision. We had a fella, uh, it's been a couple of months ago, maybe longer than that. One Sunday afternoon, Travis uh, Huffman called me. He was on his, it was Sunday afternoon, he was on his way to Arkansas to see, visit relatives or something. He said, I just got a call and there's a guy sitting down on the church parking lot and he wants to be baptized. Can you go down and talk to him? I said, sure. He said, I said, what else do you know? He said, that's all I know. So I go down, actually Drew was at our house, our youngest son was there with us that day visiting. I said, Drew, come on, go with me. We go down there and turn up, here's this fellow sitting there in his pickup. 
We'd been sitting there for about an hour by the time we, everybody got figured out who was, you know, going to go down there. And, you know, got out and I said, how can I help you? And he goes, well, I want to be baptized. I said, well, what brought you to that decision? He said, well, my wife's a member of the church out in Amarillo. I live in Amarillo. And uh, he was there. I'm here working, temporarily working on the highway construction. Which made me mad at him right then. But anyway. <laughs> no, he said, I'm working on the highway. And I said, well, that's great. I said, well, you know, what? He said, well, my wife's been studying with me and talking to me. And he goes, I was sitting at the hotel and I was reading the Bible and he's, he said, I've been reading that book, Muscle and Shovel, since she gave that to me. I read it. He said, I've been reading the Bible. And he said, I just got to thinking this afternoon, if I die today, I'm lost. He said, so I'm ready to obey the gospel. When he used that term, I knew he knew what was going on. Yeah. And he said, and he asked me, he says, when you baptize me, are you going to baptize me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? I go, sure. So I knew he knew what was going on. He said, and for the remission of my sins, I go for the remission of your sins. So we took him and we baptized him. You know? And when you know, he got out, he was crying like a baby. He was happy. He'd had a rough life, but you know, he was turning it around. I said, well, you know, come to services. He goes, I might, but I'm, he said, I may be back home in Amarillo by this weekend. I don't know. I, you know, kind of job he had. I guess it was because actually that's the last time I ever talked to the guy. Never saw him again. But I'm assuming that that's what happened because he said that probably wouldn't happen. So what was his level of, of openness to Christ? Excellent. Excellent. What did I have to do? Ask him two or three questions. What had been done? Who had done all the work? His wife. And he was receptive enough to sit in a hotel room and study his Bible himself and say, I need to do this now. You know, This was a Sunday afternoon and he could have waited until Monday morning, he could have waited until Wednesday night. I need to do this now. See, there's people out there like that. and That's who we need to look for. You know, total resistance, we're probably not going to get very far. That's why Christ gave it to his disciples. That instruction. Maybe you need to move on. Shake but, the dust off your feet. Huh? Shake, Shake the dust off your feet. But we're going to find other people who are aware and have some level of interest, and then we're going to find people who are ready. But how do we find these people? Keep looking. Keep looking. So, how do we improve our evangelistic efforts? By going to the church every day. Every day. First of all, let's look. Let's think about. And we asked some of these questions last night, so you may already have this slide, but we need to go over it again. Where are you right now, evangelistically? If you stay on the present path, what's going to happen, congregationally? Where do you want to be? Set a goal. Can we develop a plan to reach the goal? It's no good to have a goal if you have no way of knowing how to get there. When you think about <clears throat> goals, you know, they have to be, I call them smart. And by smart, I mean, first of all, they have to be a goal that you can attain, a goal that, that you can measure, a goal that uh, is relevant to what you're trying to do. A goal that's transcendental. <laughs> that means you can pass it to other people and other people will work with it. So, you know, it's just not something we pick out of there. Well, what's the goal? Our goal is, you know, we're going to be at 450 people next week. Well, not quite attainable. Not realistic. But there are some things to do. And then what resources do we need? How are we going to carry it out? What are we going to do? What do we need to get started? 
when will we achieve the goal? What if we don't set a goal? How many of you right now individually have a goal when it comes to evangelism? Hopefully when you walk out of here, you'll have one. But you know, let me give you a good goal. And I don't know the number. The number is your number. I don't like to say, well, we're going to baptize 22 people. Here's what I like to say. We're going to expose 150 people to the gospel. I planted. Paulus planted all water. God gives the equity. I've exposed X number of people to the, to the gospel. What do I need to expose those people to the gospel? Maybe I need some tracks. Maybe I need a radio program. Maybe I need a TV program. Maybe I need to get on a Facebook page. Maybe I need a website. First impressions are important. And I'm going to give you a criticism right here that I see in a lot, a lot of congregations. You put out a website that people can find with one little search, Church of Christ, Denison, Texas, three or four pop-up, Church of Christ, Dallas, Texas, 200 pop-up, whatever. And you start looking at the website and say, what do you find? Basics. Usually, here's what you find. Oh, here, click here for the bulletin. And the last bulletin that was posted is 2022. I mean, 2021. You know? Click over here for sermons. The last preacher on there was the preacher before the present preacher. You don't even have anything current. Nobody keeps their websites current. What kind of impression does that give people? It's not important to us. It's not important. Right? Facebook pages. Don't get me started on Facebook pages. <laughs> I'm not saying don't have a Facebook page. I think they're good if you use them the right way. What do we put on our Facebook pages? Church. Look at church Facebook pages. What are you going to see? Pictures. Hundreds of pictures of people eating. <laughs> <laughs> the last fellowship meal. The Valentine party for the whole folks. Now those are nice things and they're important, but what did we teach anybody? Well, we let them know we care about each other and we enjoy each other's company, but did we teach them anything about Jesus? You get the picture? What does that tell us? Nothing went into planning. Nothing went into how we can expose people to the gospel. We didn't develop any of that. So we need to do, every once in a while, do a self-assessment. Here's what we need to be doing. On a personal level, developing our, our personal skills of reaching people, of exposing people to the gospel. Learn to teach. You say, but I'm not a teacher. I'm, we covered that early on. That he doesn't expect us all to be teachers. But learn to teach. Privately, publicly. Communication skills, to be articulate, you know, come across as somebody who knows what you're talking about. Learn to listen, how to ask the proper questions at the proper time, how to have empathy when someone starts telling you their problems and their stories, how to encourage, uh, Proper tenacity has to do with that being aggressive and not aggressive. How to problem solve the problem and organization. Those are skills that we should be looking at all the time as we go. And we're going to do this one here in five minutes, in thirty minutes. So everybody, take a deep breath. If you want to stand up, stand up. If I don't get it to come up, we're not going to do it at all.
Here's what you can do. Yeah. We talked about that as, a, as we're going to have a culture of evangelism. We all participate. We all uh, contribute. We all work together <coughs> in different ways. What was one of those things that says it was the combined influences brought about to bring a person to a decision to follow Christ, right? Combined influences. So we all have a role to play. What are some things you can do? Well, share the gospel, obviously. You know, the commission is not an option. God doesn't give it as a suggestion. It's our role. It's what we do. But, you know, a lot of times we feel inadequate in that regard. So that's why we were talking about skill development, knowledge development. And, you know, some people just don't have the nerve to try it. But we've got to overcome that. Courage is involved. And maybe you failed and you tried and, you know, you need to go back and try again. So, what else can you do? Well, there's power in sharing the gospel. You remember this story with John standing there with, you know, talking to two of his disciples? It says in verse 36, And they looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say that. And they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and said, Why are you following? And they said, or it says, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He says, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him for that day, and it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Highlighted part of that. He said to his brother, We have found the Messiah. He brought him to Jesus. Now comparatively speaking, when you think about Peter and Paul, Andrew was not a well-known, you know, great orator. We don't have any of his sermons recorded. He didn't write any books. Right? He wasn't this great preacher like Peter and Paul, not a noted church leader, church planner. He didn't go on missionary journeys. But he was a great sharer. He was a great worker. What if Andrew had never brought Peter to Christ? Think about that. See, the power here was in bringing. He brought him to Christ. Every one of us can bring people to Christ. And we don't have to make it more difficult than it actually is. And we, there's other evidences of Andrew bringing someone else to Christ. He brought the, uh, well, he brought Peter here. In John 6, he brings the boy with the fish and the loaves. In John 12, he brings the Greeks who wanted to see Christ. He brings them. See? Andrew says, I'll just bring you. Just come along with me. There's power in bringing. So when we talk about roles in the church and what you can do, just bring people. You know, we can do that. Nothing is more important to introduce than introducing Christ. Why would you want to bring someone to the services? Life. They see what it's like. It gives them the opportunity, hopefully, to see a loving, caring congregation, loving, caring group of people. You know, it gives them the opportunity to hear the truth publicly proclaimed. It gives them the opportunity to hear it taught to them, to others. It exposes them to the gospel, maybe for the first time, when they get here. Maybe the first time you've ever heard the pure truth. So we've got to bring people. That's basic evangelism. No hope without Christ, so I'm going to bring you to Him. Secondly, there is no single best way to introduce Christ. 
You know, we have other examples of people running to tell the good news. People running to tell people and to invite people in the brain. Philip went and invited Nathaniel. Brought him over. The Samaritan woman at the well, she went and told her friends and neighbors, invited them to come see who this was. Levi invited his friends in Luke chapter 5. Cornelius, after Peter was coming, went and got his whole household and got his friends to come over to meet with Peter. There's all kinds of ways to do it. We talked about performance or command last night. God just expects it to get done. Well, bringing people is one way. There's others as well, but and there's no one we can say this is the best, but there's ways to do it. So it's a legitimate way to win souls to Jesus. How do we know that? We've seen it work. We all know people that other people have brought to church and now they're still here. Now we know people who've been invited to study and that, you know it's led them to Christ. We've seen evangelism work, so we know it works. So it's legitimate. You know, maybe, I don't know, 10% of people, of Christians, have what I would call the gift of evangelism. In other words, it's just a natural thing with them. You know, Greg's a natural. I've seen him do it. Heard about him do it. You know, maybe other people, we don't have that quite that ability to take someone, and what I'm talking about is taking someone from limited knowledge of Christ all the way over to a point of obedience. Right? Some of us don't have that, that talent to make that happen you know, smoothly. But some of the 10% can do that. And you say, well, that's, you're telling us we don't have any of the rest of the 90 you can just sit back and watch old Greg work. You know, to watch the other 10% work. How about relieving their load? How about taking something off of them that you could do that would allow them to do more evangelism? Hey, he's having to teach four classes a week and two lessons or three lessons. What if I taught one of his classes? That'd give me more time for evangelism. I may not be that great at evangelism, but I can teach a class. She's over here taking care of these kids. Maybe I can take care of the kids while she goes out and talks to people about Christ. There's all kinds of ways for us to help. For us to, to contribute. When I was working with this sales group, I found out real quick there were a few in that group of 50 or 60 salespeople that sold a lot more than the rest of them, right? Some were selling you know, millions of dollars every year and some of them were selling tens of dollars every year. So when, some, when I got a lead, an opportunity, who would I give it to? It's an easy question. <laughs> the one who sold a lot, right? Because they evidently did something right. They put in the effort. They worked harder. They knew more, whatever. They had the gift, whatever. They did it. They got it done. You know, when I was in high school, I was playing basketball. And I was, you know, not a very good player. Looked good, but not a very good player. But we had a guy that was a really good player. In fact, the coach told all of us, you know, give the ball to Joey. <laughs> it was that simple. You know, dribble the ball down and give it to Joey. Why? Joy was going to score. Right? So there's nothing wrong, and nothing wrong with us bringing someone and saying, Elders, here's someone I want you to work with. Greg, here's somebody I want you to work with. Kevin, here's somebody I want you to work with. That can be our role. Just bring them. It's a legitimate way to win souls. I have one lady, she was the best salesman I've ever seen in the world. Worked hard, worked 12 hours a day, wouldn't go home. 
And she'd get mad if I gave a lead to someone else. And she'd say, you know, they're going to blow that. <laughs> <laughs> and she was right sometimes. But, you know, she said, if you give it to me, I'll get it sold. Well, we had to change the culture so that it became acceptable to do that. So that people would say, instead of me having to do it, they would come and say, Rhonda, here's my, help me with this one. Can you get this one sold? And she'd say, yeah, let's do it together. And that's the kind of person she is. Well, that's the kind of person we ought to be. No, let's do it together. We talked about teamwork last night. Christ sending out by twos, those kinds of things. Let's work together to get it done. Let's assist. You know, in basketball, when you pass to the guy that scores, that's an assist. Let's assist each other. It is an effective way of reaching the lost. It's a basic principle. More contacts equal more sales. More applications means more job opportunities, right? When the sower went out, how many did he get? <coughs> One out of four, right? 25%. But he got that 25%. So, when we talk about roles, we need bringers. We need people who will invite their friends and neighbors. Maybe they can't, at this point in time, sit down and teach them all the way through. Now, they should work on it. But they can bring it to somebody else who can. So what am I saying? You need to keep Greg busy. You need to keep Chris and Rick and David busy. Bring them some folks. Right? That need the gospel. And there's this concept I always like to talk about of low-hanging fruit. Some people are easier than others. We talked about how open some people were. Think about people that you could talk to right now. People that you could talk to tomorrow morning, Monday morning, that are receptive enough that you should contact them first. And I think if any, if y'all would just, you know, sit down and give it some hard thought, you probably could generate a list pretty quickly of people you know. Uh, like I said, I was just sitting at home the other day and I got thinking about that young man. And I thought, I'm going to contact him. And it gets us personally involved. See, the lost may never come in contact with another member of the church except you. And the odds are actually pretty good for that. They know you, or you know them, and so they have contact with you. They might not know another soul in this room. So you may be the only one that ever is con that has contact with that person about Jesus. Opportunity. Yeah. What if we let it go? So we need to generate that personal list of prospects, because we're closer to them than anyone else. That's that friendship part of it. And usually we, because of that, we, it's a special way that we have that connection. So that's who we need to be talking about. Somebody said, how about, does that include family? If sure, it includes family. That may be the easiest ones. Maybe the hardest ones, but it may be the easiest ones. Because we have that connection. So he brought him to Jesus. When we take the Great Commission seriously, we can do great things. And by great, that doesn't mean... You know, something that's not simple and something that's not practical. But we've got to get very intentional. We've got to get very intentional in overcoming indifference. Indifference is God's where we're at. Apathy is God's where we're at. All those numbers we looked at last night, indifference is God's where we're at. So we've got to get intentional in overcoming it. And you say, well, how, how can you do that? Well, first of all, you've got to do something. Do something. You know, we've got to cultivate new attitudes about our role. We've got to quit accepting things as they are. 
Acts 17 and 6, do you remember how it described, how they described there in Ephesus, how they described Paul and his folks? What does it say they did? So they turned the world upside down. Anybody, any of y'all got accused of that lately? See, they took it serious to the point that they went out and did something and they were drawing attention to the point people were saying, man, they're turning the world upside down. Look at this. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. What's an appeal? Don't say it's what you do to an apple or an orange. What's an appeal? <laughs> a plea. Begging. Yeah. Some people are better planners, planters, than they are waterers, right? Some people are better reapers than they are sowers. So we all have that role, different role, what we're good at. Look at this, what he says there in 2 Corinthians 5 again. He makes his appeal how? Through us. He appeals to mankind through us. I talked about being prospect conscious, but we also need to be, and this is a subset, we need to be Bible study conscious. Who can I study with? Who can I bring to a study? When he talks about appeal, that's really a psychological concept. I'm appealing to you to think about it. I'm appealing for your, to your brain. And usually when we appeal to something, it's talking, we're, we want you to think about self-preservation. I'm appealing to you to preserve, to work out your own salvation. I'm appealing to you to want a better life. I'm, Appealing to you to, you know, have life and have it more abundantly. That's the appeal. And it's because God loves us. You know, He loves the church. He grants us this freedom from sin. He frees us from that guilt and that, you know, and we should have that gratitude towards Him. His greatest gift was His Son dying for us. So He says He appeals to people through us. So what's our role in all that? tells us we're ambassadors. We speak for God. We present His message. We have His authority to present His message. We represent Him. So if we're going to be His ambassadors, that's our role. What do we do? Let our lives shine. What happens when an ambassador embarrasses his nation? He gets recalled. Right? So we need to let our lives shine. We need to serve others. Courageous. Share with everyone. Share everywhere. Give that clear message we've talked about. You can do that a lot of ways. And these are just some, and you know, some of these work, some of these don't, some of these I like, some of these I don't, but Muscle and Shovel is a book. A lot of people put a lot of stock in it. It's worked in a lot of cases, hasn't worked, turned some people off. You know, you have to be the judge when and where to use it. Uh, there's a, by the way, there is a uh, workbook that goes along with it that's excellent to use with it. It gets people to actually have to not just read it for pleasure, but to fill out the workbook. Uh, God's eternal purpose lessons. There was a handout I gave you. Uh, I, we don't have time in our limited time to go through the whole thing. But it's just a simple, if I remember right, it's from Stafford North up at Oklahoma Christian before he put this together. It's got 10 pictures, and you can sort of memorize those 10 symbols, pictures, and it takes us everywhere to, God, to man's sin 
all the way through Jesus, all the way through the cross, all the way to our salvation in those ten pictures. And there's a sheet with the, uh, some handouts with that that uh, gives you that. You know, and then you have, your, of course, your own experiences. You know what happened for you. And you know what you've studied. So, a while ago I said, we know what to say. And we've talked a lot. How do you know what opportunity is an opportunity? During our everyday conversations with people. You know, maybe it's at work, maybe it's at lunch, maybe it's wherever. We can work into the conversation something about the church. And you have to be careful. This is that wise part. If ever the word is about church, then you're going to turn them off. But you can work something in about the church. Something that's went on at the church, some good work that's happening at the church, some lesson you heard, some activity that involve somebody or whatever. Just talk about it. You know, I, Roxanne and I were having dinner the other night. I, I took her out to Taco Mile. I was a big spender the other night. But we're sitting there in Taco, uh, Taco Casa, wasn't it? And this girl that I used to that used to work for me years ago, I didn't even recognize her. She comes in, oh, hi, Larry, and she starts talking. Well, every other word was what God had done in her life. So God had done this, God had done this, God had done this, God had done that. You know, pretty soon I wanted to think, did, did you ever do anything? You know, it was always God did this. Well, what was the problem with that? What I just told you, it turned me, I quit listening. So you have to be careful. But if you just involve something in the conversation about church, what does that give that other person an opportunity to do? Ask you about it. Find out more about it. You know, tell you something about something so that you can have this dialogue, this conversation. We talked about Jesus asking the lady for the cup of water. See, we know what to say. We just don't say it. So, here's your homework. Do something, something that's common. This huh, can't even read. Do something this coming week which you believe will give someone a good impression of your congregation and that you would be willing to tell other people in the congregation about it. See if you can get someone to come to church. See if you can talk to them. See if you can get a conversation going with someone. See, we have two primary means to win the world for Christ. The message itself and the manifestation of the gospel in our life. Our Christian life is the preparation of the soil. We're getting it ready. We're wanting to make folks receptive. But the incarnation of the Word by us, what I mean by that is they see it in the flesh. They see, you know, everyone doing it. They see Roxanne Adams living that kind of life. It's manifested. And then it helps us greatly when we verbalize that message. We prepared the soil. Now we present the message later. And we've got these circles. We work from the inside out. Those closest to us. And then we work outward. A lot of times we give up on the ones inside the circle quick. So we have to build relationships. Initial contact, getting acquainted with folks, being a servant, being a friend, sharing your faith, exposing to the gospel, inviting, those kinds of things. Interaction. How do you get acquainted with somebody? Talk to them. Talk to them. There's people sitting here that I didn't know four months ago. Maybe five months ago, whatever it was. Didn't know them at all. Never seen them, never met them. Now they buy me over their house and feed me steaks. <laughs> Not good steaks, but steaks. 
But anyway, how do we get acquainted? Started talking. Hey, where have you been? What, what, what do you like to do? We, we do that. So when we get acquainted with folks, we develop a relationship. Somewhere in that relationship, we start talking about Jesus. Somewhere in that relationship, we start talking about Christ. We expose them, that's why I like that word, we expose them to the gospel. Some kind of social interaction that leads to it. So what's our role? We can all do that. We all do it every day. We do the interaction part. We do the getting acquainted part. We do the contact part. What do we leave out? The gospel part. So we've got to learn to put that in there. Negative people. Negative Christians. Hypocritical people. Hypocritical Christians. Again, if you, do, if you look at some of the research, number one reason people give for not wanting to go to church, and again, I, you know, it could be an excuse, it could be legit, but they say, oh, those people are here, they don't live the way they say they would do. So we, have, we put out that negative presence, but negative sense, because of our own hypocrisy. So we need to live as we say we are. Positive Christian living, true Christian living draws people to us. How do you make it visible? They may see your good works and glorify God. How do they see your good works? See you helping others. See you helping somebody. Well, we're told to let them see them, so how do we do it? Well, you get to know them. You got to get to know them. Become friendly with them and be a friend. They've got to see you do things, right? See your good works. You think it helps for people to see you pray in public? I notice it. I shake your hand. I, I make a point to go find you, to go say, I appreciate it. I have a friend, business acquaintance, I've known him for years. He, he's from Taiwan, he lives in Taiwan, Taipei. And he's, he's an oddity. He's about a 6'4 Taiwanese. <laughs> you know, he's taller than I am. And he's a, he has a doctorate from the University of Wisconsin, so he speaks English very well. But he lives in Taiwan, grew up in Taiwan. And he's a funny guy. And we were having dinner one night, just the two of us, over at a place here in Sherman. And you know, they brought our food, and we were eating. And he looks up and he goes, Larry, you're not a very good Christian. <laughs> I said, well, Leonard, why do you say I'm not a very good Christian? Well, there had been a table come in with some, a family over here. Well, they bowed and prayed before the meal. He goes, you not pray before you eat. <laughs> Taught me a lesson, right? <laughs> yeah, it's little things like that. What about if you, you know, you go on break at work and you go in the break room you sit and you have a Bible and you read, you just sit there and read the Bible. What's what, you tell? what you reading? What you reading? Why are you reading? You know, or at least they know that tells them that guy's a Christian. That guy believes that. You know? Is it wrong to mention to people that hey, I, I go to the Church of Christ there in Central and Dennis? You know, you can tell them things that let them, let them know without even without being that direct. And we, we had a guy from Oklahoma last week. He was really good. And they got, wasn't that Adams guy, was it? And they got, no, it wasn't him. 
Yeah. How do we evangelize through Christian living? It's only through letting people see that we're living as Christians. They can't glorify God without seeing our good works. So we have to make it visible. There's just some things here I want to go over real quick. You know, relationship, friendship, evangelism, we've talked about door to door. Some people are good at that, some people aren't. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, I think Greg could probably tell us what works here in, in Denison doesn't work in Africa, and what works in Africa probably doesn't work here in Denison. Those kinds of things. Networking, small groups, uh, street corner invitations, booklets, handing out tracts, mass media. We talked about doing better with our web pages and Facebook and those kinds of things. See, and we can focus on different groups. Work with non-Christians who attend regularly. You ever have some of those? I just told you about one I know. You probably know some too. You know, they usually have some kind of fear. There's something that's holding them back. Maybe it's commitment, whatever. But you know, identify those folks and work with them. Work on those who stray. Sometimes we don't count that as evangelism. Most people who drop out We, it's been proven they drop out and they go unnoticed unvisited unquestioned for more than three months so we have a brother or sister that just disappears and it may be three months before we notice before we do anything if we do anything at all and 8 out of the 10 who drop out are going to do so in the first year after their baptism. So that's that critical point where we should be focused on that and re there. And the reason they drop out is because they failed or there was a failure to establish a relationship with anyone at the church. So I'm not talking that we weren't friendly. I'm not talking about that we didn't shake their hand or we didn't say, glad you're here. They didn't develop a relationship. Other reason they drop out is their expectations aren't met. They're, they're bored, they're uninvolved, they're unedified. It's our responsibility to continue to teach exactly. those new Christians. Yep. It doesn't stop at that. It doesn't stop. But you know, if we don't involve them in what we're, what's going on, we don't make them part of that culture we were talking about, then they have the tendency, 8 out of 10 are going to drop out in the first year. That's not true. 8 out of 10 are, that drop out is in the first year. Uh, sometimes it's false teaching that influences them to go somewhere else. No man that was baptized, faithful for a while, now he's went back to a denominational group. Uh, maybe it's their home and personal problems that we're not helping with. So what's the skill here? Well, first of all, it's being attentive, but second, it's compassion. We need to be people of compassion that when someone strays, we go after and we do it in a compassionate way. So maybe we serve the needs of our non-member friends by helping them with their family, their marriage, you know, maybe they're divorced, drugs, whatever their pro their problems are. We do all those kinds of things. And so it all works down to this. That God gives us these talents, God gives us gifts. We combine them all together. And we serve the lost. And we don't read of people in the Bible who are highly educated, great intellect, maybe Paul, but people who had great physical attributes, you know. Jesus just used common folks like us. With everyday people. He had a very diverse group of apostles, a diverse group of disciples, very common people, but they got the job done. Paul talked about his own shortcomings. He talked about his struggles. You know, I didn't have eloquent speech. Peter failed repeatedly. 
and yet they applied their gifts and they got the job done. So we all have a role to do and we can all do it. It's 12 o'clock. I hear there's some food across the way. Any uh, instructions? Charlie Morris is going to have our closing prayer okay. before we leave. But then we all just